Warning to easily offended listeners. Today's episode contains comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. It's time for another insufferable episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Welcome to hell. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I love that song. Tell me about it. It's good stuff, huh? I wish there were more of these stories so we could use it more. Oh, wait, there are. Spoilers. <laughs> this is Rich Outfield. And Big Anglovich. Welcome, and everybody. This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. See, I got it backwards. It's been so long since we've had an episode. And then Brian has to come along and ruin our last one. <laughs> but this is episode 182 <laughs> you think we're the drabble cast again come on rich well if i thought i were the drabble cast i would say hey folks thanks for all your donations <laughs> and all those parsecs thanks for giving them to us that's right we're running out of shelf space <laughs> in the studio Hang on while I play us a original theme Banjo song that I wrote myself. I love Battlestar Galactica. Oh yeah, on the banjo, that song would rock. Oh yeah. No, in fact, Rish, this is episode 136. You are three years ahead of schedule when you say this is episode 180. Are you saying that there's a chance that we'll still be here three years from now? It's possible, but it would be at least three years before we get 50 more episodes. Maybe five years ahead of schedule with that. You've just depressed me. You think about Oh, wait, 10, wait, life does that. Ten episodes a year... <laughs> <laughs> really? Only doing 10 episodes a year? Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's I scroll back. I myself lazy. Let's scroll back and see what 2011. Where are we at here? Well, it looks like we put out episode 112 this time last year. This day last year, for that matter. So, that's 34 episodes. Are you kidding me? Since uh, this time last year. Although, the, well, I no, guess... No, no, it's 24 episodes since this time last year. Oh, yeah. Darn, I was getting all excited. That's still two a month. That's not bad, right? Actually, we, you know on. what? We need to pace ourselves a little bit better. We yeah, need to enjoy life, smell the roses something. a little. Don't you guys have anything interesting to talk about? Uh, we have a return guest here in the studio with us today. Studio. <laughs> you mind I cook burrito in your studio while talking? Wow, he's got a point there. Hey... My last two kids were conceived in this kitchen. Show a little more respect. Ew. Uh, we welcome once again the Incredible Hulk. Thank you, middle-sized Anklovich. It's bit... Uh, never mind. So, Hulk, have you heard of our show? The Drabblecast? Yes, of course Hulk hear of it. Well, actually, that's... Uh... Hulk big fan, too. Strange stories for strange listeners. Funny banjo songs. Uh, Hulk, just, I... Just let it go, Rish. All right. Let's get on with the interview. Wait, after the last one, I can hear hundreds of people turning the podcast off. Rish, hundreds of people don't even listen to the podcast. Well, you know what I mean. And technically, billions of people don't even listen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, with us once again, the Incredible Hulk. Thanks for coming back, Hulk. I know come back for you, puny outfield. I come back for Big's toilet. Oh, no, I just replaced the old one. Hulk hope porcelain's stronger on this one. Yeah, so do I. So, Hulk, uh, last time you were here, uh, we talked to you a little bit about Avengers. Yes, Avengers, available on DVD and Blu-ray. Not to get on Redbox. Not to borrow from fat ex-sister-in-law. Buy movie. Do you get a portion of the grosses on that? Adjusted grosses after recoup, not net. Are there any special treats on the DVD that we should check out? Special edition replace Hulk's fists with walkie-talkies. That little joke. No, seriously, 
buy Avengers movie on first day or Hulk smash. Do you have a Blu-ray player, Hulk? Blu-ray comes standard on PlayStation 3. So, what do you think makes Avengers worth buying, Hulk? Because Hulk say so. I make offer you can't refuse like Godfather. I put Beta Ray Bill's head in bed with you as wake-up surprise. Yes, but I don't, I don't like to buy movies anymore. I'm a cheap douche. What makes Avengers something to watch again and again? Movie filled with character moments. Treat all characters like main character. Naked lady from Equus, Nick Fury's boss. Hulk punch out Chitari War Serpent. Girl who play Maria Hill pretty. But plus, there's that scene where you bash the floor with Loki. That would be fun to watch frame by frame. This true statement. Oh, you know, that reminds me. My cousin and I were arguing whether you were actually trying to kill Loki in that scene. You wrong in argument. Yeah, but you don't know which side I was arguing for. Your side wrong. See, I was saying that... No, 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 sorry. He was saying that you were just trying to take Loki out. That the banner side of you was tempering your actions and... Hulk make joke, but you not laugh. And I was saying that, that what you did would have killed anybody else. But because Loki's a god, he... Puny Outfield keeps talking. Interrupts Hulk. He does it to me all the time, too, Hulk. He, he thinks it's his show. Oh, that reminds me. I saw the Man of Steel panel at Comic-Con last month. When you were here, you said that Batman couldn't beat you in a fight. I never say that. What? You think Batman could beat you? Oh, hell no. Batman just regular guy. Do we not have this conversation already? Batman puny human. Sure, he's smart. But Stephen Hawking smart too. Stephen Hawking no beat Hulk in battle. Yes, but Superman... What about him? How Comic-Con footage look? Uh, more CG than you. That too bad. CG is tool, not entire toolbox. Uh, are you a fan of Superman? Yes. He never make any money saving world from Solomon Grundy. You know, my nephew is always asking me who would win in a fight between you. Hulk never meet Outfield's nephew, but safe bet is on Hulk. No, he means between you and Superman. Oh, Superman is strong. Superman move planets. He trick educated with hat and glasses. He pretty much God. Oh, don't tell that to Clay Duggar. No, God with small G, not big G. So you're saying Superman would win? Maybe, but Superman always play fair. Hulk no play fair. What do you mean? Like Hulk once lose to Thor because Thor used thunder hammer to hit Hulk in green grape basket. This know something Superman would do in fight. Wow, that sounds pretty painful. Yes, nuts hurt so bad Hulk turned briefly into Billy Batson. Wait, wait, that's Captain Marvel, isn't it? Yes, and Hulk when Thunderhammer strike his junk. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Uh, what do you watch for entertainment? Hulk like Family Guy and NCIS Los Angeles. What about Big Bang Theory? There was an episode once where Sheldon dressed up as you to go to a costume party, but got raped by a homeless man in a parking garage? Hulk no watch Big Bang Theory. F*** Big Bang Theory. Hulk, millions of people watch Big Bang Theory. Millions of people are f***ing idiots. Numbers no mean anything. Millions of people bite own toenails. Well, no, no, I think what Big is trying to say... Stop talking. Hulk not smartest hero, but Hulk smart enough not to watch show that say green people bunch of idiots. It's not easy being green, they say. No change subject. You think legions of Hebrew people watch weekly series called Big Nose Jews Worth Poop and Pee? Show not made for geeks. Show mocking geeks, saying they worthless, backward, mouth-breathing, underweight, brainiac, man-boys worshipping nonsense. Good only to make middle America laugh and feel better about themselves. Would women watch a show called Bitches Ain't Shit But Hoes and- Rish Outfield not talk about things he not understand. Yeah, Hulk's got a point there. Hulk have time for one more question. Then Hulk have to go. Uh, where do you have to go? Hulk have to sign paper. Me going to be poster boy for Earth Day. Get it? Because Hulk green. Well, that's too bad. I, I wanted to ask you more about the summer movies this year. Hulk enjoy Madagascar 3. Me like racist zebra with funny wig. True dat, Hulk. True dat. Me try to watch Battleship movie, but leave after one hour. There no Battleship. Oh, shoot. You just missed it. 
Did you uh, walk out of dark shadows because there weren't any dark shadows? Hope not see that. Ebert give it bad review. What about the new Total Recall? Yes, Hulk see that because curious about three boobed woman. But CG give Hulk headache. What about the boobs? That what Hulk talking about. Mm. Did you see that movie The Watch? No. Violence against innocent cow in trailer make Hulk sad. <laughs> Big and I cried during Brave. I cried all through Amazing Spider-Man. You two couple of pussies. Hulk never cry at movie. But, but you just said that the cow... Ah, uh, Hulk just used that as excuse not to see tired Ben Stiller Vince Vaughn vehicle. So what does make the Hulk cry? Oh, onions, when stub pinky toe, people who leave animals or babies in hot cars and forget them, hot peppers, old Willie Nelson songs. Okay. Obese children, people who say global warming is liberal propaganda as excuse oh, to be lazy oh. and selfish. <laughs> Direct TV right. drop Hulk's favorite channel. Uh, people, okay, Hulk, I think. People who like call me maybe song in non-ironic way. <laughs> When okay. stores not okay. carry oh, purple oh. pants. Uh, People who use personal beliefs to curtail rights of others. People who love Dane Cook comedy. The way things. Disney Channel Jeez. take preteen girls and make them loud and sexy. This year, last season of Breaking Bad. Barbara Streisand's okay. song, Way We Were, oh. when she talk about scattered pictures of smiles we left behind. Wow. Okay, Hulk, uh, you've given us a lot to think about. That why Hulk here, little Anklevich. That why Hulk here. But we want to thank our special guest for coming in today, uh, and we really appreciate you not smashing us. It touch and go there for a minute, but Hulk much calmer now than when younger. Oh, uh, and thanks for replacing my toilet. And good luck with you journey into podcast, boys. Uh, we're actually uh, the Dune Steve here. That nonsense word. You change podcast name. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll consider it. Hulk must go now. You take care. You too. Anyways, we've got a, a story for folks today. Is it a returning author? I, I, I don't know how to do this anymore. It really has been a long time. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll give you a cue. And it's a returning author. Oh, joy. Pig, could it be J.M. Barry? I uh, close, but no, that's Peter Pan. Peter Pan flew with children, Lois, in a fairy tale. J.M. Perkins. But he said we could call him John. Oh, you're right. Ooh. John is here to give us a new story, everybody. And it's one of our favorite series, as a matter of fact. We don't do a whole lot of series. That's because, because they stopped sending them to us. Because oh, wait, we don't Because have... our submissions have been closed for over a year. <laughs> It's because we don't have an iPhone, and that's what you get Siri on. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> Are we just talking over each other this time? It's not even an attempt to be civil. Yeah, it's our one of our favorite series, A New Chemo Story. Are you ready for this, folks? I don't think you're ready for this, Jelly. You know, the town of golden showers. That's right. Today's story is Chemo, The Pieces of Erica Smith. Hey, hey, let people know Dude. where they can find the other... Because this one is a prequel to the first chemo story and a sequel to the second chemo story and a midquel to the last chemo story. <laughs> That's right. We started with part three, then we did part one, and now we're on part two. I don't know if that was part three, though. I'm not sure if there's others in between. He pretended he wrote it Woods. just for us, remember? <laughs> Again, I talked right over you. <laughs> yeah, anyways, it's somewhere in the middle. It's the uh, the mid-quill. Would you say that the folks who haven't heard Town of Golden Woods and the Condemned would appreciate this more if they had? If they ran out there and donated to the show and... Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might enjoy the theme song better knowing that it appeared in the Town of Golden Woods because it's an awesome theme it's song. It's not possible to enjoy the theme song more. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, if Town of Golden Woods appears after this story, then it, you shouldn't need to hear it. Also, it goes in a direction you might not want to know is coming. Yeah, that's true. You might not want to know that it's coming because what happens in that story, I don't know. But listening to The Condemned can only make things better. Can't make it worse. 
Because he refers to what he happened. does. Yeah, he darts off the story mentioning uh, the last one. So, well, we're thirty-four minutes into the episode and we haven't started the story yet. Yep, and we shan't. <laughs> Let's for just another, end Wouldn't another be- thirty-four minutes. We're going to keep going. I bet we could too. But there are links to the other J.M. Perkins, or as we like to call him, John stories in, uh, oh, in the shoot. show notes. I'm sorry, I just got a text. Stop calling me John. Oh, okay. Uh, JM's other stories, the links are in the show notes. So if you want to go check those out, I would suggest listening to The Condemned first, this one second, and Goldenwood's third, because that's the order they're actually supposed to appear. And you should also get ready because this ain't funny. <laughs> the hell <laughs> sorry has, has anything we've said been funny I... <laughs> yeah, I just can't help it anytime I say get ready the uh, line from that Paul Revere Beastie Boys song comes into my head it's just that certain time of childhood when that uh, song came out that it's just ingrained in there forever is that uh, the wiffle ball bat song yes that's the one can you give us a little sample of that line I did it like this I did it like that I did it with the wiffle ball bat so <laughs> I'm on the run, the cops got my gun, and right about now it's time to have some fun. Warning, today's episode contains singing. That's right, Ankh Oatfield is here. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's the return of Ankh Oatfield. You know that first album went 10? Yeah? Yeah. What is it, that's 10 copies, right? Yeah. Oh, that's not bad. Sadly, the... Uh... The first album went paper. <laughs> Which is what you get when you sold your first copy. That's right. It's certified paper. All right. I like that. <laughs> anyway, 37 minutes now. Get, <laughs> get ready. Uh, I totally forgot where I was going to go now. The Beastie Boys totally sidetracked me. Well, we right. also got a text that said, stop calling me John. Maybe that derailed. Okay. Could be. Okay. Before we got sidetracked, I was going to say, get ready. Because J.M., some people call him John, but we're not allowed to anymore, has got his full chemo novel novel put together. He's putting it together now because uh, we talked before. He has a kicks. He had, I should say, had a Kickstarter campaign to raise the money for it. And that went swimmingly, apparently. And he has now got that money and is going for it. And, and oh, so I forgot he, he did mention that we contributed in no way to him achieving his Kickstarter he campaign. He did, he did, yeah. By the time we finally told people about the Kickstarter campaign, it was over. But we're going to contribute because we're going to tell you right now that you will be able to o- order that soon and give him money for it. I think it's available now. It may well be available now. And if it is, look in the show notes. There will be a link to be able to order J.M. Perkins' full chemo novel. How about telling me about today's author? J.M. Perkins is a full-time writer based out of San Diego. He's looking for readers, representation, and remuneration in that order. Those are the three R's. You've heard about them in school. Ricketts was not on the list. (laughs) Strangely. He tends to write violent science fiction and horror stories that make his parents slightly concerned about his mental state. Was that undead Casey Case I'm thinking (laughs) of? Keep your feet in the grave. And <laughs> Keep reaching for the top of the hole to climb out. When not writing, he reads obsessively, makes art, avoids blogging, and organizes urban vinyl art shows. Hmm. You can find links to his work and time-wasting videos at his website, where you can also contact him. Now, today's story was produced by one of our biggest fans. Oh, oh, was it Andrew O'Dell? No, he stopped listening to the show when uh, you said that comment about uh, female circumcision. Oh. Well, then uh, Michael Stone, the author of our Uh, third story. No, yeah, he gave up the show a long time ago because of the stuff that you said about cats. Oh. Oh, well, I wasn't thinking. Nigel. Nigel's our uh, number one yeah. fan. Yeah, Nigel found the video podcast and, and then he took his life. Um, Wendy Cooper? 
Yes, yes, it was Wendy Cooper. Apparently, her internet connection was not fast enough to be able to watch the video podcast, so she remains a fan. So, yeah, Wendy produced this story for us today, and the cool thing is this is her first try at it. She heard us say, why not, and finally said, you know what, why not, and gave it a shot. And so she threw this together for us. And here we go to get a chance to listen to Wendy Cooper's first production. Yes, thank you. And J.M. Perkins' third story on our show. You know, people said when they watched that video podcast that I was quite mobile for a burn victim. Yeah, it's true. I guess that was a compliment. I don't know that it was, actually. (laughs) Okay, so uh, here comes the story. Get ready. The awesome theme music by Roger Subirana starts now. S hat magic spider. (laughs) No, you're wrong story. of Erica Smith by J. M. Perkins The only animals left alive are those that have learned not to threaten mankind. Now we mostly discover new ways to threaten ourselves. Book of Chemo Chapter 8 Verse 3 With tooth and nail, with gun and blade, I've come. I didn't need the biofeedback calm, not that night. I recited the cadence because when you're trying hard not to die, saying badass shit helps. And it's hard to feel like a tough guy when you're addressing a cell culture that's invisible to the naked eye. Hello, Mrs. Smith, I greeted the 60-year-old cancer. In chemo, you get used to calling a lot of things cancer. Cyborgs, poltergeists, and cults. I had to remind myself that this time, on this mission, I was addressing a literal cancer or tumor if I wanted to split hairs. Alternately, I could have said the Hello Ursi line, or Ursi Seiten Gartleri, but Mrs. Smith felt right. Two months after the events in the prison, I found myself pondering the etymology of my enemy in a pristine research center nestled in the heart of the UC San Diego campus. Yeah, the organization doesn't give you much of a chance to catch your breath. I'd had to break a couple of electronic locks and hoof it up two flights of stairs while avoiding overexposure to the security systems before finally reaching my target. The place was nondescript as far as labs go. Clean, sterile surfaces, all in sciency white and stainless steel, smelled like industrial disinfectant. Chemo had sent me here to hunt an immortal cell line that represented a potential threat to the body of mankind. I spent every week of my first couple years as an agent amazed at how increasingly bizarre my life became. A week before trying to puff up my chest to a bunch of tumorous cells, I'd been sitting in Cleveland with 20 other agents. We'd been awaiting a briefing in a conference room on the third floor of a generic office building civilians wouldn't offer a second glance. I didn't know any of the other agents. This was unusual. I'd been active long enough that I usually recognized one or two at the various meetings, but not entirely unheard of. Since my initiation at the prison, I'd made an effort to meet as many agents as I could. Rapport with my peers would save lives if we were paired up in the field. 
that it'd be years before I learned the true size and scope of chemo, and why they didn't utilize stable squad rosters like the traditional militaries. Like all my briefings, this one began when Instructor Jones entered the room. This one is different, so I need you to shut up and listen. Jones seemed more off balance than usual, like he was struggling to gather and prepare the words of the briefing that he had no doubt memorized hours ago. He flipped through the intel packet on the podium before him, peering at the printed words. He took a deep breath. Back in the early 50s, a woman named Erica Smith went to the hospital because fluid was seeping out of her genitals. Cervical cancer ended up killing her, which is terrible, but nothing special. Nothing we would or should care about. Except... Jones took a piece of clear plastic from the folder, placed it on the projector glass. Too old school for something as futuristic as PowerPoint. Except her doctor cultured some of the growth after he tried and failed to remove it. And it's been growing ever since. And because researchers all around the world demanded identical human cells to experiment with, the good doctor went into the business of selling these tissue samples. Jones flipped to a new slide. A graph showed weight over time, how much the culture had grown and was projected to grow in the near future. The numbers were dizzying. Inhuman. The Ursi line can basically be found in any good-sized bio lab anywhere in the world. This is true even if they never ordered it. The immortal tumor was used to help vaccinate against polio and is currently instrumental in AIDS research. So, what exactly is the threat? Jones continued rhetorically, segueing with more or less what I would have asked. The master agent placed yet another slide onto the projector, displaying the threat assessment report. It is estimated something like 10 to 20 percent of scientific experiments are ruined or altered due to contamination by the Ursi line. The thing has become a noted laboratory weed, which is exactly what it sounds like. I am sure you're thinking, though, that these are fragile little human cells. They cannot do much by themselves, right? They cannot spore up like bacteria or lie dormant for centuries like viruses. Conventional wisdom is that human cells are weak on their own, they will dry out or get eaten or any number of things. The Ursi line is anything but normal nowadays. It has already proved itself functionally immortal. The line has branched and changed as a result of obscene amounts of exposure to viruses, carcinogens, well, there's a fucking irony for you, poisons, pesticides, and deep space. He shook his head. You would think the eggheads had never read a fucking comic book before. The room echoed with scattered nervous chuckles. <laughs> a chill look from Jones stilled the room back to silence. Let me cut to the heart of this matter. This thing has to die because we don't want it to become contagious. I hadn't known cancers could spread. Jones replaced the transparency. Scientists, in their infinite wisdom, have already produced a couple infectious tumors. A nurse got colon cancer in her hand after a slip-up with a needle. They produced one with gerbils. Meanwhile, there are a brace of natural varieties. The wild contagions are an infectious face tumor in Tasmanian devils, and the canine transmissible venereal tumor... Our technician agents estimate that to be about 2,000 years old. The Tasmanian one will probably burn itself out. It grows too fast and kills too quick to be much of a threat. The undead dog STD, though, that one is more subtle and sly about what it does. There are actually meetings amongst the master surgeons concerning that puppy. I laughed, <laughs> catching my mouth in my hand when I realized it wasn't supposed to be a joke. I should have known that Jones wouldn't be the type to use terrible puns. With the Ursi line, the lab boys estimate there is something like a 60% chance it will become communicable to humans within the next decade. Jones paused. Before that can happen, we kill it. We scrub the wayward cells from the face of man's world. One week from today, we're activating a full half of eligible agents to destroy the Ursi line. This is one of the most complicated operations chemo has undertaken, 
but we cannot help it. If we do not succeed on this one night, the remaining samples will be far more jealously guarded, and the collateral cost of eradication will far exceed our will to kill it all. We also have to take out about 83 other cell lines we think have been contaminated by Erica Smith's progeny. <clears throat> the instructor cleared his throat. I looked down, stunned by the scope of what we were going to attempt. And this was half of chemo? How big was the organization? We only have one shot. There are going to be a bunch of away teams to step in if any agent fucks up his or her target. But heaven help you if you are the agent we have to bail out. I will find your ass. Master agents are tasked with the harder targets, military and the fortified industrial research labs. You lot are going after softer targets, hospitals, podunk research labs and the like. But your specific targets are waiting for you in your inboxes. I hope you understand the gravity of what it is that you are doing. If even one of you does not perform the task as required, all work, all the sacrifices of your brothers and sisters will be for nothing. I remembered that speech as I walked the laboratory aisles, my butane torch burning blue hot. I scorched anything labeled Ursi, or any of the other 90-some names of contaminated cell lines we were conditioned to burn. As I tried not to breathe in the little tendrils of plastic smoke, I wondered, what were we doing to the future of scientific research? My phone buzzed in my pocket. I looked down at the little screen, read a text. You hit silent alarm, dumbass. Shit. The message was one of half a dozen presets I'd rigged for delivery if I did something stupid, like tripping a silent alarm. I didn't even have time to question why I would call myself a dumbass. The lab didn't have security I couldn't deal with, but I really didn't want to kill anybody. All I wanted to do was eradicate another threat to the human species. Damn it. Men were running down the hallway, big men their feet hitting the floor like they weren't pumping their arms. Probably meant they were holding something in their hands. That meant they were running at me, guns or best case, tasers already drawn. Good for them. They were doing their jobs just like I was doing mine. I didn't want them to die like the guards in the prison, not if I could avoid it. Still, Erica Smith was ending tonight. That wasn't negotiable. And I would be damned if I was the one who didn't handle his target, Drew Jones' ire. I'd be damned if they'd have to drop one of the quick-deploying air crews to finish what I couldn't. I primed my thermite munition. No time to be cute with the torch tonight. Normally, we use the most generic, low-cost tools that'll do the job. But any idiot with Google would know what we were after come morning. Moreover, they'd know that this was the work of a powerful, well-organized group. I was going to burn down the whole lab in a way that couldn't be confused with anything other than deliberate sabotage. The munition set, all I had to worry about was how to keep security from killing themselves. But I already knew how I would save the lives of the Renicops. I didn't want to do it, because it was stupid. <sighs> No helping it. I was going to run, they were going to have to chase me, and I would force them to pursue me to safety. I pressed one of the buttons on my earpiece, scanned through the CB channels they were likely using. I picked up their chatter. I went off in the cancer lab. Cameras in the area aren't working. Be careful. Police are on route. You can do this, I thought to myself. I jumped out the door, suppressing my conditioning in order to make as much noise as I could. I lingered by the hallway's corner, waiting for them to come into view. Come on. Come on. Stop, a voice said. I started to run. I sprinted down the twisting corners, immediately grateful of the floor plans they made me cram before this mission. I could lose them. I was in much better shape than my pursuers. But I didn't want them to rest, huffing, calling in backup as the firebomb 
pour through the entire floor. They needed to feel like they could still catch me. I heard them split apart, one moving toward the stairwell slash elevator to try to cut me off. Damn, they were smarter than I'd given them credit for. I ran flat out. I reached the stairwell as one of the guards spotted me. Stop! I didn't. Police had already begun to surround the building by the time I pushed through the door to the third floor. Must have been a slow night. When the locals are bored, it always makes the cloak and dagger stuff harder. Of course, the three squad cars parked out front didn't prevent me from hopping out a window and climbing down the wall, though I did almost break my fool neck in the process. I shucked off my hoodie and sweatpants to reveal the tight tank top and jogger short shorts underneath. I wadded up my clothes and what minimal gear I had with me and threw the bundle into a donation box adjacent to the lab. The iPod strapped to my arm and plugged into my ears continued to scan the police bands as I assumed an unhurried jogging rhythm. Moving down Main Street, nobody bothered me. I wasn't due to report back to Kimo for several days, but I wanted to know how the mission went. I could call and ask Julia, or any of the other dozen agents I've grown close to, but I was supposed to lay low and stay in cover. That's why I ended up sitting in a public library and reading the announcement on one of Kimo's websites. The site doesn't advertise that it's the web portal of a secret society slash cult dedicated to dealing with cancers on the body of humanity. You need to know the code phrases to understand any part of that. Without esoteric knowledge, the page looks like the online diary of a somewhat illiterate tween girl. Before I went to the organization's page, I browsed the major web portals. Not a single story about our operations last night. I wondered if Kimo had done stuff like this before. Unnoticed or quietly hushed by a government that didn't want to appear weak. Maybe that's how we got the weapons I swore we shouldn't be able to afford. By blackmailing powers that didn't want to be embarrassed. Curiosity peaked. I navigated to Kimo's page. I scrolled down for an entry backdated seven days ago. I wanted to take a few minutes here and mention how hot my crush is. I counted the number of exclamation points in the blog title. Odd numbers mean success. Even numbers mean failure. He's is so totally cute. If the first sentence repeats an important word, it means everything went smoothly. If it uses a synonym, it means we had some difficulties, but nothing we couldn't handle. If it is not a repetition of the title, Kimo encountered problems. Major problems. I scanned the rest of the entry, gleaning bits and pieces of intel. The other library patrons probably worried about a 20-something so captivated by the ramblings of some 8th grade girl who really liked glitter as an HTML design element. I didn't even know if 12-year-olds really wrote like this. But then I started thinking about all the other information that is possibly, hell probably, encoded in this entry about how many other blogs are out there with secret messages shooting back and forth in all manner of innocuous communication. About the number of stations springing to life to drip obscure mutterings into the airwaves. And about how we couldn't share our findings and fears, trust the scientific community to do the right thing and destroy the Ursi line. I was thinking about all of the secrecy and code and compartmentalization and it made me a little sick. I left my computer, an overeager homeless man replacing me almost instantly. I walked down the street, intent on getting myself a double scooped cone. Because, hell, if I was going to be stuck here in San Diego for a week, I might as well enjoy myself. As I walked down the sidewalk, I thought about the letters I wanted to write to Julia, Kenneth, and Greg.
chemo cut my vacation short. This in no way surprised me. The vibration of my prepaid single-use cell phone clattering across the hotel bureau woke me. The screen displayed a text message, innocuously coded, of course, ordering me to check my inbox via another chemo blog. Back at the library, I learned I was to be part of a small list of agents reporting back to Cleveland, where I was supposed to check in with a master agent named Burke. I couldn't imagine anything worth killing in Cleveland, but knowing chemo, we might end up leaving on a plane to one of those stan countries to fight an insane dictator and his zombie army. Or something weirder. A short flight later, paid for by one of my disposable profiles. Chemo farms a lot of IDs. And I landed in the city. I learned quickly that, no, we were all in the right place. Turns out, Ursi wasn't dead yet. Agent Burke, my superior for the rest of this, introduced himself. Every bit of him screamed Agent so loudly that I couldn't imagine how he ever managed any kind of cover identity. I felt safer being near him, and for some reason, he seemed familiar. We've got another building to clean. Ten agents. The civvies are starting to figure out what we're after. So stay sharp. We conditioned ourselves with the mission particulars. Burke waited until sunset for the nine to fivers to go home to their families to initiate the hit. I spent ten minutes of our drive to our location playing twenty questions with him. I was starting to perfect my playing dumb bit. Why'd they miss this place? Why didn't one of the airdrop teams hit this place? I mean, we timed everything to our hit of the Ursi line in the freaking space station. Burke looked at me, adjusting the big pack strapped to his back before he resumed staring out the window. All right, then. A couple of minutes from our destination, Burke decided to talk. He gazed directly into my eyes, sizing me up. You're wondering why I look familiar. Not a question, but a statement of fact. Like he could read my mind. Yeah, I was... I was there the day Chemo found you. I remembered. Three of the monsters. Later I would learn that Chemo calls them the Whisper Men. Moving through the courtyard, bodies still straining and changing. My cell phone won't work. Nothing electronic is working. I watch what they do to Rebecca from the crack in the closet door. I can't even close the door. It's like it's stuck, and I'm so scared. I know that I'm next. One of them seems to be sniffing. Coming closer. Coming closer all the time. Those wisps of what could almost be speech. What I almost understand but don't want to. And it's close enough that I can smell the blistered green stink of it. And then its head explodes. The others turn, still making their whisper sounds. Men with combat shotguns spray double-odd buck, taking them to pieces so other men with flamethrowers can burn them, change them to ash so they can't put themselves back together again. I'm still hidden when one of the men opens the door and pulls me out. Tears fill my eyes, and I'm trying to fight, but he looks me up and down and is telling me, You're okay, okay, kid. kid. You're You're gonna gonna be be okay. okay. It was you. You're the one who saved me, I stammered out. Burke, nodding. Thanks, I said, realizing instantly how shallow and insufficient the word was. Burke gave me a little half shrug, a no big deal shrug, before giving his gear a final once over. Through the years of conditioning and missions, through the blood and pain and betrayal, I sometimes struggled to remember why I did it. Why I risked my ass fighting things that shouldn't be. Training and practical realities push you to stop valuing human life. But in that moment, sitting in that van driving to finally end Erica Smith, it was all so clear. I volunteered to become a tool of chemo so that no one would ever have to suffer the way I did. I risked my life so that someday... If I got good enough, I could be somebody else's Burke. 
somebody else's hero. Of course, it's easy to lose sight of that. Far, far too easy. Snapping out of my reverie, I struggled to refocus on the task ahead. The facility resembled the lab I had firebombed. Something like a squat office building, almost square and indistinguishable from other uninspired corporate architecture. Except that this place stood alone, fenced in and watched. As we grew close to the target, the van dropped me a couple of blocks away. The plan was to approach from multiple angles. I ducked under a loose corner of chain link and trotted through the parking lot towards the entrance. A round security guard rode out in a golf cart. Why do security personnel seem to be invariably comprised of the morbidly obese or recent immigrants? He stopped the vehicle and stepped out. Before he had a chance to talk, I pulled the stun gun out of my hoodie pocket and shoved the prongs into the soft flesh of his neck. Zizzy zap! And Chubby fell. Five agents sprinted in from different directions. The other four of our crew were busy posing as special FBI or some other agency drones. They'd already called police. When the cops got there, they'd flash some credentials and my confederates would order them to set up a perimeter. Following FBI orders while grumbling about it is one of the specialties of local law enforcement. We took another ten minutes to seize control. The facility possessed only two more guards, our fear of increased security apparently unfounded. Carefully, we doctored the security system. Nothing so crude as bashing, just a little something to throw off the electric eyes while we worked. Burke handled it, trying to explain to my uncomprehending ears. I was too busy scanning for potential threats to understand what he was saying. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Something was wrong. Burke called to check in with the four posing as FBI. Everything was all right there. The police were following the script. The sooner we finished, the less questions there would be and the less our fellow agents' improv skills would be tested. Burke pulled out a list. In addition to Ursi, there's half a dozen other potentially contaminated cell lines they want us to hit. He scanned the paperwork, glanced up at me and the five other agents before crumpling the orders and placing the wad back in his pocket. Fuck it. Burn anything that looks like a cell culture and we'll let the scientists sort it out. We were supposed to be done with this yesterday. He opened his pack, distributing handheld flamethrowers. They resembled modified cans of hairspray. Which, knowing chemo, they might well be. Secret world-saving organization or not, chemo does it on the cheap. Then, Burke handed out gas masks anyway. Why are we using these? I thought there wasn't supposed to be anything contagious, I asked. Burke shrugged. I've watched too many good men get poisoned or infected. Word of advice, any time there's a lab or a new critter... Use a gas mask or a full mylar suit if you can. Plus, they'll help with smoke. I took the mask, wishing I'd had one in prison. Burke worked as he talked, his hands moving with the grace and confidence born of long practice at opening your bag even if bullets are raining down on you. Let's go, Burke said, making me incredibly relieved that someone else was in charge this time. We split into several two-man teams. I was paired with Burke. He touched his throat to activate the mic. Everyone in position. He ordered us to wait at the tops of the stairwells so we could enter the fourth floor lab at the same time. We had to pause a couple of minutes for the two he'd sent down to the basement to seize control of the sprinkler system and climb back up to our position. Go. We fanned out, each exploring different rooms on the fourth floor. I stayed close to my partner blasting bursts of flame here and there to torch the sciency looking stuff. Outside hallways and rooms clear, we shifted our attention to the sealed central lab. Burke stopped, making us all wait again, confirming that the other agents had done their jobs. I didn't know why he was so cautious, or why I was so jumpy. 
We'd already dealt with the security, already swiped their cards and codes and keys. Based on the chatter we were getting from outside, the fake FBI was handling the locals. We opened the first door, letting it seal behind us. Again, we paused for Burke to confirm everyone was in position before we swiped the security guard to gain entry to the lab proper. Something shot towards me. God! I exclaimed something wordless through the gray plastic of my gas mask. I think I was trying to curse. I dodged backwards as some kind of tentacle shoved a horn-like appendage through the air where my head had previously been. I fell on my back, prone and vulnerable. Bert grunted, pulling me up and back away from the thrashing rope of the flesh. The thing writhed, trying to stab at where I should be. We hugged the wall between the two doors out of reach. Bert kept watching the thing, pressing his throat mic to call the other agents. Report. Everyone chimed in, some of them screaming, fighting, same thing. As soon as the door opened, some kind of tentacle had attacked them. One of the others was stabbed, bleeding, but nothing critical. He mentioned something about using the placebo mind and confirmed he'd been able to keep going. Push forward. Finish the job and we'll get out of here. The claw puckered into the jellied meat of the thing, sucked away through the semi-translucent flesh. An eye puckered out through the socket the horn had occupied. A brown human eye. I bet Erica Smith had brown eyes. While I struggled, fumbled to comprehend what I was seeing, Burke brought up his weapon. A blast of his can-sized flamethrower caught the tentacle. The appendage squirmed, pulled back into the lab where the rest of what we were fighting waited. I didn't think. I started moving, flamethrower in one hand and my pistol in the other. Praise be for chemo's conditioners. Thank them all and pass the ammunition. The lab wasn't large and I could actually catch sight of the other agents and the puffs of flame they issued. I couldn't really pay attention to them as I was too busy trying not to die. Hundreds of strands of spiked, studded, and eye-lined tissue whipped about the room, trying to kill us. The tentacles weren't tough. They were wispy, hollow, comprised of knobby strands of glittering segments of flesh. The way they undulated made my stomach seize up and clench. I used biofeedback to suppress that. I heard the sounds like flesh sucking, like sphincters opening and closing as the things moved around the room. But, praise be, they dissolved to ash quick enough if caught by a blast of flame. We were going to be fine as long as we didn't run out of gas. Hundreds, maybe thousands of tentacles slapped and stabbed at us. I watched as ten of the things wrapped about an agent in the far corner. His arms pinned at his side, he screamed as he fell, his gas mask clattering away. One of the tentacles butted, split, as pinky thick pieces of new growth inched towards his nostrils. He was screaming as the thing tried to enter him. All was a tumult of flesh, each strand terminating in a spike, hook, eye, or sucker. Some of the tendrils ended in small mouths with white human teeth. I circled a table, avoiding storage bins and gray-brown computers. I tripped against an industrial refrigerator, my knee knocking the door open. A quick, horrified glance inside revealed miniature tendrils of flesh wriggling from about half of the carefully labeled test tubes within. I torched the interior of the fridge, my nausea at the little strings of flesh making me use more flame than required. Burke was behind me, eyes always moving, every once in a while, letting out another puff of flame until he ran out. The canister made a little coughing sound, protesting. The things, whatever they were, had not stopped approaching. I'm out, he said. Agent Joseph. You lead and I will spot. Most of these things are coming from the inner lab room. Head there. Aye, aye. 
Something thick and muscled curled around my leg. Shit! I said before the tightening mass retracted, pulling me from my feet. I cursed and tried to get an angle on the tentacles so I could fry it without giving myself third-degree burns. The thing tightened as it pulled me, strong enough to crack the bone. I sat up, even as it dragged across the smooth floor. I was about ready to say fuck it and burn the thing along with my leg when Burke saved me for a second time that night. The master agent jumped over me, landing heavily on the piece of Erica Smith clutching at me. My movement stopped, almost like the cancer was pausing to think about its next move. Another heavy trunk of tissue bunched, moved to flick Burke off. The master agent was faster, his knife blade flashed as he severed the thing holding me. The coils around my leg relaxed, and the rest of the tentacle thrashed about, leaking something dark purple that smelled like rotting berries. Look out! I yelled, grabbing the back of Burke's shirt. Three more appendages shot out at us from around the legs of the table. I pulled Burke down so I could beat back the probing flesh with flame. I'm done with this, Burke said. He touched his throat, bellowed. All agents, pull out. Regroup on the ground floor. I'm setting the package. Burke pulled out a nondescript box, some kind of explosive fire starter he'd hauled up here. It was not the blinking, beeping thing you'd expect from movies. Instead, Chemo builds their bombs inside tote boxes, something you could see FedEx carrying. What looked like a heavy-duty egg timer dial sat behind one of the recessed flaps. Burke turned the dial, my flame drying out as I exhausted the fumes to fight off more of the proboscis and probing flesh. Burke pulled a jar out of his pack. He grabbed a truncated piece of the cancer and sealed it within glass. He placed the sample back in his bag. Go! We ran. I wondered if only my missions ended in something getting firebombed, or if that was all chemo missions in general. In the lobby... Burke slapped a pair of cuffs onto me. He was careful to be gentle, kept the unyielding metal from cutting into my wrists. He'd already pulled his baggy street clothes off to reveal the bulletproof vest over business attire. He led me outside, while the other agents, slipping into their roles as FBI or criminals, left the building and rescued the bound security guards. We hustled into an official-looking van in plain view of the surrounding cops. The package exploded, filled the fourth floor with flame and concussive force. In a precision-timed symphony, the demolition charges wrapped about the support columns, went off, and toppled the building into a polite, dust-belching heap. I was comforted that, whatever Erica Smith became in the end, it wasn't smart enough to defuse a bomb. I sat back in my seat, exhaling. Nice to have a solid win for once. So there you go, folks. Very first story without an author's note, ever. Oh, you know it'll have an author's note. Oh. We'll sit there and let it sit on the shelf for a week or more until we get one. Damnation. <laughs> author's note. First off, I want to thank Big and Rich for writing pieces. This is the third chemo story that Dune Steve has produced. As a matter of fact, the novel Chemo, How I Learned to Kill began as a Dune Steve broken mirror story three years ago. And everything... The successful Kickstarter campaign, the 19 Nocturne Boulevard adaptation, and all the other awesomeness wouldn't have happened without you guys. Thank you. For the listener, I want to point out that while Chemo, the pieces of Erica Smith, may seem far-fetched, a lot of it is surprisingly non-fictional. Cancers can be contagious, and the cases Jones mentions are real. Perhaps more shockingly, there was a woman who died in the 50s whose tumor is still growing today. 
I did not make that up. I did, however, change the name from Henrietta Lacks to Erica Smith because what happened to Mrs. Lacks and her descendants is rather tragic. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about their grandmother turning into some kind of B-movie monster. You should definitely check out the Wikipedia article about Henrietta Lacks. It's fascinating. Lastly, all you listeners, I just hope you enjoyed hearing the story as much as I enjoyed writing it. If you're interested in reading more about Joseph, Burke, and Chemo, the book is available on Amazon and my website, strugglingwordguy.com. I don't know that we have a uh, cast list on that one. It was just you and me and the Clay bottle Duggar. makes three tonight. Was it Clay Duggar? Well, well, wait. The bottle makes three. <laughs> Can you hum a little bit of that for us? <laughs> that was originally the theme song to Town of Golden Woods, and we. I don't know why you changed your mind at the last moment. Yeah, I just. <clears throat> no, it was just you and me and. Was it Clay Duggar? It was either Clay Duggar or Marshall Latham, but my guess is Clay Duggar. That wasn't Marshall Latham. All right. I'll tell you that much. I can recognize that guy's voice, and that wasn't it. Must have been Clay Duggar. We're going to do a whole episode in this place. (laughs) Oh, please no. No, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, yes, there is. Have you seen that Snickers commercial where they have uh, Joe Pesci on it? I've seen no Snickers commercial. Tell me about it. (laughs) Well, it's those ones where uh, you've got like two guys, right? And one of them is Joe Pesci. And Joe Pesci is just all yelling at people. What? I'm funny to you? What am I? Am I a joke to you? And they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, Peter, come here. Here, eat a Snickers. He's like, what? I don't want a Snickers. F you. And he starts swearing just a blue streak. And then he eats the Snickers. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, you feel better? And then you notice that... Oh, he's no longer Betty White. It's not Joe Pesci anymore. It's the guy who is Peter, and he's wearing the same clothes as Joe Pesci was wearing, but now he's a regular guy, and he goes, oh, yeah. But they're always like, yeah, here, whenever you get hungry, you turn into a diva or whatever. And like the other time it's, you know, Liza Minnelli or something like that. It's like, what? You know. So that sounds like a pretty good ad campaign. Yeah, they're kind of funny. I like them. The Joe Pesci one's pretty good. Sorry, that's totally beside the point. But that's all we're doing today in today's episode is stuff that is beside the point. Brought to you by Siri. (laughs) On iPhone 5. She will threaten you. (laughs) So we were saying something. What? Now, this one had somewhat interesting origin behind it. You and I appeared on Patrick. John versus Patrick. Is that how they talk? No. How do they live with themselves? <laughs> the John versus Patrick podcast, which JM runs with a guy named Patrick. PJ. Really? I don't know. The hell? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I just was, I received a text. John versus Patrick is no more. Uh, apparently Patrick, I was going to say took his life, but I don't. You received a text. Come on. You don't even know what a text is or how to do it. No, 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 no. That's sex. You're oh, thinking. oh, sorry. Sex. Text. Sex. Text. They do rhyme, kind of. Okay, what were, you were going to make some insulting comment about John versus Patrick. Go ahead and do that in the morning. Oh, well, I, I, I actually just received a text. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's funny because the whole purpose of John versus Patrick is for them to compete against each other in an awesomeness contest. And each episode, they try and one-up each other in awesomeness. And we got interviewed on his show and as part of john's attempt to out awesome patrick and uh interestingly enough that swung the balance right once and for all it was decided that patrick was way more awesome oh. than john was because of wow we've really harmed us JM way more than uh, <laughs> we've ever helped him yeah dang so there you go but as i was saying we appeared on that podcast and John was telling us about the forthcoming novel version of Chemo and that there was going to be a Kickstarter program. Is this correct? Am I telling the story right? Yeah, so far. Okay, so the guy says, if you bring- wash your f-ing hands and make me a tuna sandwich, right? That's, that's how it went. I'll tell you the rest of that joke when we're off the air. So we thought that it would be really cool in promotion 
of this upcoming, I made finger quotes, Kickstarter campaign to produce another chemo story of John's. This was a year ago, right? (laughs) The funny thing was, at the time, we had no episodes of the show. All of our producers were like, oh, I'm going to need like another month. I'm sorry. And every one of them was saying that. And we're like, but we haven't had an episode for a month. Um, um, and you're finally like, okay, we're going to do this one because we do it quick and we're going to read it today. And then I said, well, you told me to write a story. And, and so I wrote this story. And you and actually did it. Yes. And it was unfortunate. Yes. And so we did unfortunate. And then this John Perkins story just got, you know, shoved to the back of the line, you know, sent to the back of the bus where it belonged. Well, I knew that I would have to edit it. And at that point, I was still like a third of the way into Dead of Tetramana. Uh And so it was like, oh. I got a text, actually. This just came from Mark Ellis Stone. It's Dead of Tetramana. Damn it. (sighs) Okay, this is it. You've been pronouncing it wrong the whole time. Let's announce the end of the show. (laughs) But before then... Uh, so I, I was like, oh, shoot, how are we going to do this? Should I go ahead and, and edit chemo for our next episode? Or should I go back to working on Dead of Tetra Mana? Which we accepted during the Clinton administration. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I felt like, well, I probably should do the, the older story. And yeah, it just it got forgotten. But then Wendy Cooper said she would produce for us. And so we just sent her the file and she did that. And got it back to us really quickly, and then it just sat again. And then it disappeared into a oh, pit of despair. A oh. pit of despair. Don't, <clears throat> Don't even try and escape. Walls are much too thick. Yes, that too. But that was lame even for you, Big Anklevich. <laughs> yes, announcer man, you crystallized my own thoughts there eloquently. We found out the hard way that if you don't immediately pull out the file that somebody has sent you, it disappears. Yeah, it can, I guess. Didn't understand how that happened exactly, but... But yeah, while all of that was going on, John had his Kickstarter campaign. He tried to raise enough money to publish an actual book of chemo, the entire novel, which has these stories in it and more. And yet he was successful. It's the first Kickstarter campaign in history to actually be... Oh, wait, no, they all are, right? How does it work? Weren't we going to do a Kickstarter campaign to go see Battleship? We did do a Kickstarter campaign. We went to do it, and then we went, okay, this is way too much effort just to get $40. So we just made it a donation starter campaign, and we said, if someone will donate this much, we will go see Battleship in D-Box. Thank Mao Zedong. Nobody ever donated. We never had to see Battleship. (laughs) But anyway, I finished my production, and I got that episode out, and here we are, finally, producing it. And I hope a couple of (laughs) bosom buddies, yeah? You thought I was going to go somewhere, and I went nowhere. Sha-na-na-na. What would you do, baby, without us? You take the good. You take the bad. And then the, a step uh, lower than that is the Dune Steef audio fiction <laughs> magazine. Today's show sucks. Now is the time to turn the episode off. Yes, yes. I, I, he and I don't usually see eye to eye, but ooh. Okay, well, whatever I was saying, it doesn't matter anymore. I, I, it, I, I, I was making it up as I was going along. I realized I was naked in front of the class. <laughs> and I started awake. <sighs> and you had a huge erection. <laughs> Well, huge is being generous. Well, okay. Relatively speaking. None of that talk now. <laughs> oh, Clay, I don't know why I'm so giddy right now. I Clay actually gave giggling. us his telephone number on there. 210. It was Clay Dugga then. Back on topic, guys. All right. Okay, so here we are. Don't uh, say it. <laughs> with our third chemo story. Now, now is that a record? I'm pretty sure it's definitely not a record. As Tekka clan. We got a third Popoka story. Okay, so it's tied with Popoka. We've got... Do we have four Catastrophe Bakers or just three? Just three. Just three. Okay, so it's tied with Catastrophe Baker. We can't have any other uh, series that have gone three, right? 
What, what about the ghost hunter, the Australian ghost hunter guy? Uh, I think we only got two of those. Oh, yeah, he hated the way that we pronounced Australian <laughs> words. <laughs> when we went, Australia, Australia, Australia. We Amen. love you, yeah. We got other stories that were not ghost hunter Ernie Pine stories. I think we only had two Ernie Pines. And then we had the ghost ship one. But we actually have a second uh, side to Gert story. story coming up, though, so... That one's still down the tube. So we haven't even got two in that series just yet. Why are we still talking? Can we just end? Yes. No, no, we wouldn't want to do that to the, to the one person that's still listening. <laughs> and he's just fallen asleep. Yeah, he, he was reaching for the stop button when the handful of pills that he took kicked in. <laughs> he's sleeping. He's sleeping a, with the fishes now. Metaphor. <laughs> Is there any other series that well, we have? Well, there were Club. I thought of Club, too, but I knew it only made two, so definitely couldn't be competing. Do we have got another series? We probably have a series that's gone like 10 episodes, and we're just not even thinking of it. Heck no, I don't think we have 10 episodes. <laughs> but We haven't had 10 episodes in a year. Oh, wait, we determined we had 20. How many of these would we have gotten more of if we hadn't closed submissions? I'm looking at the paper, May of 1997. We would have gotten one more. Okay. Jason Sanford gave us two plague bird stories. And how many episodes did we split those into? Nine? <laughs> uh, just three, actually. So mm. I wonder if that counts as three stories, therefore. That means Cory Doctorow gave us two stories, too. <laughs> Whatever happened to that guy? I, you know, I was hoping he would make it. Yeah. Usually, once someone's made it onto our air, then they don't make it anywhere else. That's right. We're kind of the Ted McGinley of podcasting. Uh? That's right, Scoob! Ted McGinley? Who the fuck is that? Zoink, Scoob! Now, Casey does the voice of Shaggy, and yet I can't do it. I hate Casey (laughs) Kasem. Don't you have anything worthwhile to say? Yeah, well, this is our third chemo story. How much has this world grown on you since uh, we first were introduced it back in the Broken Mirror? The first ever, I believe, Broken Mirror story contest way back whenever the heck that was. How much more excited are you about getting to read the entire novel as opposed to just being spoon fed a tiny little baby spoon size of a story every three years or so? Not at all. Oh, Okay, good. Let me see if I can come up with another question, because uh, I think I I shot my whole load with that one. I liked the first story, and so, uh, you know, hey. Right, right. And it was obvious that there was more going on Mm -hmm. in that first story, and we continue to get little... I mean, like in this one, there's a mention of how he was recruited. Right. And a mention of the whispering... Whisper men, I think it was. Okay. And they looked remarkably like Tori Spelling, I believe you said. Or maybe that was my imagination. That's the thing about reading is you just put it into your mind's eye and imagine it how you will. I saw more uh, Bill Nye myself, so... Oh, can I trade you? (laughs) I guess we're just being really silly in this episode, but... No, no, no. Uh, Yes, yes. But uh, no, I, I, I like the series and I would like to read the book, but I'll make an admission to you. I don't read. I can't read. You can't read. I think Rish is right. Uh, well, you know, the, the interesting thing about this story, which I, I found, I mean, we've only had three, obviously, so it's not like we have the whole thing laid out before us to go through. But what I found really interesting about this story is this is the first time, like you mentioned before, we have the flashback of before he was a chemo agent and we suddenly see oh there's some kind of stuff going on in this guy's past before he's just been chemo agent he's trying to prove himself he's trying to do what he's supposed to do he's kind of a new rookie kind of guy so he's only uh just getting started he idolizes burke but we don't get any of that other stuff. This is the first time we get to see that there's something more to Agent Joseph's character than just that uh, straightforward kind of, I'm going to achieve and be a good chemo agent, which I'm sure is probably one of the character arcs uh, through the course of the novel. I would assume that he goes from being rookie to being... And now he's Crash Davis, and he's the guy that's been around the block. You know, I'm sure that's what we'll get. 
with this character, or uh, I don't know, I can't say I'm sure that's what we'll get, but maybe we'll get something uh, like that as he progresses along. But it's interesting to see that there's something, you know, weird in the background. And, and we find out a little bit about how they recruit their people. I mean, he was a kid, I guess, at the time that uh, Burke came and saved him from the Whisper Men. Tori Spelling. Now he's grown up and he's become an agent and, it, and it's got something, I guess that's what happens to people, how they become agents is they're somehow rescued from werewolves or whisper men or vampires or whatever. And uh, through that experience, they wind up taking up the mantle and uh, going forth to destroy the cancers. Do not shoot as the heathens shoot. Your mocking me. Who think that with their many bullets they shall kill? Oh, hell no, Big Anklevich. I would never mock. Okay. But yeah, I I, I found that uh, part of the story really interesting. It's cool. It makes me want to read the rest of it or podcast the rest of it all the more because of that. I find it uh, captivating, enchanting. Say more words. Exciting. All right, well, there you go. I mean, if we accepted submissions, maybe we'd get another story <laughs> from him. I appreciate the people that have sent us stories and the people who have volunteered to produce for us, like Wendy did and Brian did last week. And who did the week before? He kicked friggin' ass, whoever he was. I think that was and, me. Oh, well, I take it back. <laughs> and I, I hope he also forgives us for our shenanigans today. Yeah, our shenanigans are a little shenanigany. Is that a word? Yes. So everything is a word now. As long as you say it enough times, it is a word. So let's say it a hundred more times. Ready? No. (laughs) So I had two things I wanted to say before we go. Okay. One is we recently took over Journey Into, that podcast of Marshall Latham's, and now we've been on every episode since. In fact, it's a a new rule that (laughs) we have to be on every episode and... We get 25% of any donations that he receives. So Unfortunately, far, his show is just like ours and receives no donations. So we haven't got a red cent. So donate to the Journey Me Into podcast right now. Come on. Yeah, it was interesting. I was just on the show again the other day. I did a uh, reading of Barry Coleman, Hero. You know, By I, Muriel W. Lafferty. That's right, yeah. And I, I figured that since she made his name rhyme with Gary Coleman, that she must have wanted it to sound like that. So I did the whole thing in a Gary Coleman impression. And uh, I think it and turned you, out and well. And the part where you ad-libbed what you talking about, Keepsy, that was brilliant, man. Yeah, it, I think it really turned out well. <laughs> Unlike most stories that we do, I actually just read that by myself without you uh, holding my hand and telling me, no, no, no. Try again, child. You sucked at that one. Spit spot. Run along now. Uh, <laughs> you are uh, seriously <laughs> the worst thing we've ever done. You were Including there. that snuff film we shot up for YouTube. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, you weren't, uh, you weren't there. I did it uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Just I had to get it out there because Marshall was like, hey, uh, you know, I want that like now. And no, he didn't say that. I don't know what he said, but I figured, hey, I better get this done. And it was something that it was just me that had to do it. So I just did it in my bedroom by myself. I've been there many times. <laughs> not not your bedroom. Moving on. <laughs> and it was weird because I didn't know if it sucked, if I was doing all right. I mean, I, I've read stories by myself before. Not a lot, but, you know, I've done some, and maybe we'll uh, pull those out someday and use them as incentive episodes or something. I did a few readings of your stories that I haven't uh, ever pulled out, like that memoir of a serial killer, memoir of a geisha, what was it called? Memoirs of a... Say more words? Something with a memoir. Do you remember the story? The film student one. Confessions confession. of a film school dropout. Shopaholic, you know. That was the story. And I read that one before the podcast even started by myself. And I did it all like, I'm a sad guy. And you're like, well, you know, that kind of sucked. It really was supposed to be like a crazy rant. And you did it all like depressed and sad. So, And it was the last story of mine you ever recorded. So, so you, you kinda, took it to heart. Except for the 15 we've done on this uh, podcast. I don't know. I, you said that it turned out okay. So I guess 
Maybe I didn't. Suck. I was being nice. <laughs> I, I, that could be true. I don't know. Maybe Marshall won't now, finally, won't have us back for the next episode. It's about time. <laughs> but uh, you guys can check that out uh, over at his site. And one other thing he has done right now, he's got a, a writing contest going on for all the month of October. Hmm. And basically it's a Edgar Allan Poe tribute story contest, kind of like Norm Sherman does on his podcast with, with the, the H.P. Lovecraft. The Lovecraftian The H.P. Lovecraft and all that stuff you kids are into now. It's, it's, it's a clever idea. He wants somebody to write a Poe-esque story using a title of one of Edgar Allan Poe's poems or stories. Check that out over there. We're not going to do an October Scary Story event on our show this month. So all of your creative juices that you were saving up in a bottle, use them on Marshall's contest. Drink them down and use them on Marshall's contest. I'm not sure that's hygienic, actually. <laughs> and then you mentioned incentive episodes a little while ago. This is your last chance to hear uh, You've Got a Friend, which is my last incentive episode, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have something else up replacing that soon. That's right. And then one last thing, in an effort to stir up donations and gray hairs, <laughs> we've decided to do another marathon podcasting event. Actually, I decided and you just laid there. Yeah, I'm but thinking of England. Whatever gets me there. <laughs> we've decided. Do you remember when we did the daily podcast failed experiment no. I don't remember that. Did that happen in February this year? Because that entire month, I, I can't remember a thing from that. I, I've gone to psychiatrists and, and hypnotists and everything. No one has been able to make the memories of that month resurface. I, was that when it was? Well, see, now I'm starting to wonder. Did we really do a whole month or did we just do a week? Well, I'll, I, all I know is that I can't remember a single thing from the entire month of February. But, well, that's what our listeners also. But often, if you if you say February enough times, it causes me to scream and rant and rave. So something happened in February. That's all I know. Well, maybe I should have thought through this October thing better. <laughs> I, I, my plan was for us to do 13 episodes in a row, daily episodes, for the 13 days leading up to including Halloween. And we would just talk about some spooky topic each day and podcast stories our own stories mm -hmm. during that time then i realized that this was insanely ambitious and we should have started in july and so i canceled the whole project what, what do you think should i uncancel it well you've already announced it on the show now so yes but people have all turned it off including john <laughs> all right well then it's canceled all right. Don't look forward to the 13 days of Halloween, folks, because it's not going to happen. And so there's no point in asking them to donate to the show either. Not really. No, it's not going to happen. You know, the funny thing is, though, this episode's not going to come out until November. So it doesn't really matter. And we really don't have anyone to blame but Wendy Cooper. It's, it's sad. It's all Wendy's fault. <laughs> the late Wendy Cooper. <laughs> she no, finally no. got a internet speed up and watched that damn video podcast. It's kind of like uh, The Ring, you know? <laughs> Just anybody who watches our video podcast goes insane or wishes that they could go insane. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've talked for a long, long time. If you had any desire to hear us talk more, you could come join us at the, the last 13 days of October and listen to our daily podcast. What's the link for that? Going to be on the That Gets My Goat feed which you can find over at dunesteef.blogspot.com. You can sign up for that and you can get a whole bunch of... It's the place where we do our other crap. We used to do a lot of it as post-show chatter, but we've kind of relegated it over to this other feed where we talk about movies, we talk about whatever, so that we can deal with the really important things on this feed. Like what you witnessed in today's show. Uh, that was a mistake, wasn't it? <laughs> ah. So the, the, those were our announcements. Uh, we've already said thank you. I guess all that's left is good night. 
All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thanks for listening, and uh, have a nice 27 days until the next episode comes out. All right. With tooth and nail, with the gun and blade. Good night. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Announcer Man is the only intelligent one here. Take two. Hulk wants lose to Thor because Thor used Thunder Hammer to hit Hulk in Green Grape Basket. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wow, that sounds pretty painful. Yes, nuts. Who is <laughs> <laughs> <was> Billy Bats? <laughs> That's Shazam's boy version. <laughs> Let me tell you of the days of the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine. Behold your hosts, the dread big Anglovich and the infamous Rishoutfield.